Um, uh, Stephen is the principal uh, program manager at Microsoft in the Azure office at, of the CTO. He's also an adjunct func faculty, which is going to talk about his work in that at uh, Johns Hopkins. And he'll talk about the semester of code, which is this awesome uh, class that he teaches. Um, and John Hopkins, and I'm sure he'll tell you where all the other great exciting things, because it's not just John Hopkins this semester. Um, he was, he's been an distinguished technologist at Hewlett Packard, technical director of the uh, Outer Curve Foundation. Uh, he founded a startup and has been a writer and a consultant. Um, he's also been around open source for about 30 years. He's dating himself. <laughs> and presently, he's gov in the governing board chair of the Confidential Computing Consortium a Microsoft board member to the Eclipse Foundation and a work and a, a working group group chair uh, for an I triple E standards, which just happened and we're yeah, just started happened this just, last just week. Last we're, week. We're, yeah, we're all excited about it on Twitter. We all said yay. So yeah. um, so really happy to have Steven. Wish he was gonna be had actually come in person, just like the rest of our keynotes, but uh wow, but, uh, twist the knife. <laughs> Sorry, it's, but it's okay. We're, we're we're just happy that you're able to, to make it, and we understand that you're concerned about your class, and your and your students. So that <laughs> we understand why you couldn't be here. So um, anyway, without further ado, I'll let you let you talk. Thanks, David. Thank you all, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I'm I'm going to talk about this evolving semesters of code pilot program that we're running right now. Uh, I I was really excited by the last panel. Uh, I, I owe a debt to those people because a lot of them helped with the thinking of what over, over this last couple of years with what's become semesters of code, uh, is, especially uh, Heidi Ellis. Uh, she was looking over my shoulder, providing encouragement and, and useful pointers as we stood up the first iteration of the course a year ago in the fall. So it's it's been a collaborative effort from the start. Um, this is the uh, quick and dirty slide that I always use to say, I have done many things in this space. Mm -hmm. uh, I have been doing them for a long time. And what it's led me to though, is kind of a, a set of observations that you know, there's a problem in the industry kind of thing. And I laugh at that because, but there really is this kind of challenges that we're faced with right now. Um, there is a startling lack of understanding of open source software in production. Uh, so uh, yes, I'm adjunct faculty at Johns Hopkins, but my day job is I work in Azure at Microsoft. And I've been back at Microsoft for the last five years. And it's been fascinating to see some of the interpretation of we're all in on open source at Microsoft. And it's uh, startling to see some of the mistakes that are made. Uh, especially in you know kind of production mode. There's also I, I'm seeing a lack of knowledge around software engineering practice. I think it's being diluted in our industry. Uh, when I started, uh, there's you know software engineering skills were the thing that was beaten into you in the first six days, six weeks, six months of your job as you change jobs. This is how we deploy software at scale, and. At this point in history, when so many people can enter our industry in different channels, you know, kind of six weeks or six months of a course, and you too can be a, you know, a full stack developer, that we're ending up in a space where we're just missing those skill sets in a lot of places. And in a lot of places, they've been narrowed down to not software engineering theory. How do you deploy software? How do you develop software at scale? but it's being narrowed rapidly down to, you know, tool practices. And, you know, the last thing that, that I kind of see a lot of, and I, and I want to talk about at, at the end of this, is this idea that software maintenance continues to be hard. And what I mean by that is that there's, you know, a big aha that we all come to at some point in the industry is that software is inherently dynamic. It is constantly changing. Your software system is, you know, Rust never sleeps, it never stops evolving. And up until about 2000, we used to think, oh, that's maintenance. And you know, there was those wonderful studies that came out of places like uh, IBM Watson, where they would explain that you know, 80% of the cost of software is in maintenance. But the reality is it's no, that's the ongoing cost of sustaining a software system in production. 
it's not maintenance. And then kind of in 2001, we get the Agile Manifesto and we finally, ad we finally admit that it's not about the waterfall anymore, that really the waterfall is this rapidly iterating thing. And, but we're still in that place where software maintenance, maintenance continues to be hard. And so I wanna talk about that a little bit as well. Um, so where did this all started? It, it began as um, kind of this aha that open, well-run open source projects are natural labs for software engineering experience. Uh, well-run is the qualifier there. Uh, when, we, when we have 200 million repos on GitHub, uh, I, I do think Mr. Andreasen is wrong. Software isn't eating the world. We are drowning in software. Most of it is mediocre, duplicative, and bad. But well-run so open source projects all have strong software engineering process involved. And it doesn't matter how much governance is written down, the basic behavior of the people that are maintainers is that of good software engineers. And so I, I thought, what if we create a course that taught some basic software engineering theory and some healthy open source software project practices? You know, how, do you, how do you know that this project will be good to dip your hands into um, and, and use in your own projects and, and your own uh, products? And then teach intellectual property for engineers. Uh, some of the discussion in the last uh, panel session revolved around licenses. And I was lucky when I came into the industry, I started in uh, Toronto, in Ontario, and I was raised in a family of engineers and every professional engineer, you took a half, a, a basically a semester course in intellectual property engineering. Uh, so sorry, intellectual property for engineers. And so everybody kind of came into the industry understanding the basics of you know, patents and trademarks and copyright. And that 1980 was the year that they finally applied copyright law in America to computer software. And so it's been a part of you know, most of our entire careers. I think Tony's the only one that gets a buy in that he started a little earlier than I did. Um, but you, know, you, you live in this place that the licenses are important. And just like every photographer and every musician understands basic copyright in their industry, Every developer, every software engineer has to understand basic intellectual property. And then what if we took that as the talking head part of the class, the lecture part of the class, and then we grafted it onto this idea of getting students involved in student projects that were mentored into an open source project. And of course we package this all up in a semester and it would be great. Um, I wanted to do this as an undergraduate course because I thought that was important in terms of my concern with, uh, you know, lots more people get undergraduate degrees in computer science than get graduate degrees. So I was trying to tackle where I was seeing the main problem. And so we did an experiment. Uh, Johns Hopkins has this idea of an intercession period, which is January. And so a couple of years ago, we ran an, an intercession three week course on choose your own open source adventure. And we ran a couple of labs within that few weeks, and we kind of structured some discussion around what are healthy open source project practices. And it was, it was an interesting experiment that gave us enough uh, confidence that we could go on to create the actual open source software engineering course. And so the first time it was taught was uh, fall of 2021, so a year ago, and we are teaching it again this year at Hopkins. Uh, this, uh, basically we were focusing though, the thing that I really felt the deep value was, wasn't so much me in front of a classroom with this kind of uh, curriculum based on third software engineering, third open source practice and a third IP for developers, but it really was how do we set up these projects to enable students to have student projects in live open source projects. So, we kind of put together, we, we started sizing this. It, it was a, uh, I, I keep telling the students as well as all the mentors that we are creating this together. Um, we were guessing that we'd probably have as possibly, a, a, you know, 30 students, maybe as many as 45. And last year we had 20, this year we have 40 as rough numbers. 
Um, last year, the open source projects that participated were Paz Lutes PowerShell from Microsoft. Uh, Semesterly was a student project on uh, Johns Hopkins campus, and Open Cravat was a big research project. Uh, this year, three of them returned, and then we added additional projects. Uh, that is, I'll talk about that in, in a few minutes in terms of the changing mix. Um, the simple requirement, if you were going to participate as an open source project, was that you had to give me at least two mentors and that you had to define at least five student projects within your open source project space. And we kind of did a, a, a rough sizing that said, there's about 14 weeks in a semester. And if you treated the student project as the bulk of their homework and pretend there was a lab in the course, because lots of engineering courses have labs, um, that we could expect four to five hours of student time per week, giving us a student project of about 50, 70 hours. So that's kind of where we started. Um, we went along with the idea that um, we worked with the mentors in a couple of mentoring workshops to say what kinds of things would be interesting student projects. And so we kind of went through this you know, increasing mentorship required idea, but there was low hanging fruit. The stuff that uh, a well run open source project probably already understands that these things are you know, good starting points. Uh, for folks. And then we went after the idea of stuff that's more fun or peripheral. There might be some stuff that's core development. Um, infrastructure and automation around the project is always important. But then we were we were willing to take the exploration of you know, risky things that maybe the student would prove this is a bad idea. And that's still a that's still a winning grade. Um, so you know th this was kind of where we we chased things. Um, sorry, just quickly reading Mel's comment here. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and, and this has been kind of the challenge as, as we evolve the process is making sure that I found out this year as we expanded it to twice as many students, um, I need to automate more of the process. And I have I, I know how I'm going to do that next year. <laughs> uh, general evaluation. Uh, the student project is basically 50% of their grade. 25% of it we hit at the halfway point, roughly. Um, and then the uh, first half term grade can't be improved. This was an aha moment from the head of undergraduate studies uh, here at Hopkins who pointed out, if I don't do this, the students will all push the programming into the back half of the, the course and fail. Um, I run two midterm tests. Uh, basically, it's again, we're exploring the idea of figuring out how, how the teaching in the class is going. I'm using it more as a framework to test what I'm doing in the classroom than anything else. And then there's a 10% mark that's a uh, kind of fudge factor around class participation. I've gone to a much more active uh, style of teaching this year over last year. So there's a lot, uh, it's a lot easier to see students engage this year. Um, midterm evaluation, I'm just looking at things like, um, again, we're not saying is the student necessarily driving pull requests into a project. What, what we're looking at is that professional experience. Are they engaged? Are, did, they, did they get to a successful build in a reasonable way in a reasonable time frame? Are they checking in regularly with their mentor? Uh, we had to set that expectation this year. Uh, we didn't, we realized we hadn't set it hard enough last year that um, no, really, you need to talk to your mentor every week. And we've worked with the mentors to make sure there, there's even that idea of you know, kind of false mid midweek goals to encourage the students making forward progress in terms of describing what they plan to do. Um, and does it feel like they'll reach their original goal? But goals change. Uh, one of the things uh, Heidi Ellis said in the pa panel previous is, you know, there's a lot of tension because they're now working in the real world and the real world changes. Uh, I mentioned in the comments in the in the panel session, we had three mentors last semester uh, that changed jobs midstream. And we were lucky that, you know, two of them could continue mentoring. Uh, one of them was problematic in that we had to cover for them. But again, this is part of how the real world works and exposing the students to that and encouraging them and working with them, mentoring them past that moment was part of their learning. 
I know a lot of this sounds like Google Summer of Code. Uh, that was certainly a model and I have access uh, both uh, the one of the original managers of Google Summer of Code was looking over my shoulder as we put this in place and I'm lucky enough that I work with somebody that ran Google Summer of Code uh, inside Google for five years. So I continue to tune this based on their experience. But Google Summer of Code, like I, it's, a, it's a very different thing. Semesters of Code is a very constrained program. These are students that are carrying four or five other classes. You know, this is not their only programming work. Uh, Google Summer of Code kind of has a finger in the wind guesstimate of 150 hours. I'm playing with 50 to 70. Uh, Google Summer of Code projects tend to be bigger because of that 150 hours. So they tend to be one-on-one -on -one mentoring, whereas we've seen a lot of creative mentoring from some of the projects in terms of team mentoring. All of the mentors on an open source project will collectively mentor all of the students working on student projects, which is proving to be a really in interesting mentorship uh, way of doing things. And then the student matching period and the, the period for the student to ramp up to a clean build is considerably longer in GSOC than it is for semesters of code. Uh, and then, you know, kind of the last thing there is uh, Google's paying student stipends. Uh, the, here, their, their project is part of their grade. So there's no money changing hands, which also keeps the administration of it cleaner. Um, things that are new this year. Uh, we're exploring the whole idea of distance learning. I've got uh, 15 students at University of Galway uh, that are also part of this. They've got a local professor anchoring it. So they're, that's the person that's doing the administrative support of they're responsible for the students' grades. So I don't have any responsibility as, as a Hopkins, uh, as Hopkins faculty for their grades, that, that's handled. Um, but it was a matter of I had, they overlap directly with the class. So I'm basically running a Zoom session because we're still in kind of semi-pandemic mode here where all classes have to be uh, re recorded. And we were already uh, running it on Zoom because some students might have to isolate. And so the idea that students are both either tr tracking the recordings or just dialing in. So my morning class in Hopkins is an afternoon class in Galway. Um, we're also experimenting with student projects that you'll have multiple students tackling the same piece of work. Uh, one, of, uh, one of the projects, for example, uh, Patternfly from Red Hat, they're doing a huge amount of accessibility work on Patternfly. So it means that the mentors at Red Hat are, are, are you, uh, working with several students that are all working on accessibility issues. And they aren't directly um, you know, collaborating, working on the same issues, but they are working side by side on, on a similar set of issues. Uh, I've gone to a more active learning style in the classroom. I'm not sure that that's working necessarily yet, but it uh, certainly has the students more engaged than last year where I was lecturing at them. Um, you know, the big aha that I had was uh, the same kind of thing that folks that have learned about active learning. Um, and I realize that the collection of you as professors probably already know this, but you can be a highly entertaining lecturer, but the students still aren't necessarily learning. Um, so I'm trying to engage them differently this year. And then I've doubled the student population. So next steps uh, as we continue to scale this out, um, it means I'm, I wanna scale for more students and I'm also scaling for more schools and programs, so more channels. Um, scaling for more students means scaling up mentors and student projects. So there's some automation I need to put in place there. Uh, I'll be starting probably in the January timeframe to start to drive the mentoring workshops earlier in the year. Um, and that way we can also ensure a smoother on-ramp for students come the fall. And then scaling up for more schools. Uh, you know, I, can, I continue to be asked at Microsoft because they do enable me to do this. You know, when do I get to thousands of students? And I keep saying, well, you know, this is only the second year we've run this. Um, but I want, I'm building, a, I'm pretty happy with the curriculum. I'm still tuning it. Uh, this kind of third, a third, a third. But I want to be able to create a pipeline of industry-based instructors, people that look like me, that um, aren't educators, aren't researchers, but can work within a university setting. And that, you know, people don't scale. 
uh, community scale. So I need, in the same way that we're building a community of mentors, I need to build a community of industry instructors that can hang their own stories on the curriculum in the same way that, you know, I can hang the stories that I've lived through for the students. Um, and then that idea would be that candidate universities in this space would be able to support such contracted uh, instructors, same as Hopkins is doing for me. So why are these ideas exciting? And this is the point where I was really glad to see Mel was uh, here today. So about six years ago, uh, somebody that, I, I, that hired me back to Microsoft broke me by introducing me to Peter Nauer's programming as theorem building. It's a paper that goes all the way back to 85. The basic premise in the paper is why is software maintenance hard? Why is it hard when a collection of people have created a complex piece of software? Why is it hard for the next group to take it on, to maintain it, to evolve it? And he comes up with a theory behind it, but he's not satisfied with the theory. And, and I think that the basic thing that he argues is it's that translation of the mental model of the theorem of the theorem of the software that's hard to transfer to the next group that is going to to work on that software. And then, um, actually, reading some of uh, Dr. Chua's work, I also came through and discovered Gene Lave. Uh, Gene Lave did some seminal work uh, out of UC Berkeley back in the 70s, 80s, and into the 90s. Um, and the first book that I encountered was this idea of cognition in practice. And it, it, the basic premise is all learning is social learning. Uh, she went on to do a book with one of her grad students, a Chan Wenger, uh, called Situated Learning and Legitimate Peripheral Participation a couple of years after that. And basically, this is a book about apprenticeship. And um, both of these books, I would point out, um, they are written by anthropologists for anthropologists. They, they are a non-trivial read to somebody like me who basically lives in the software engineering world. Uh, but you start to realize that all of the, what they're talking about is this idea that it's about community building and how do you successfully translate the mores and culture of a community? And how do you translate that learning in uh, kind of these practiced ways. And you start looking at, well, I, I've lived in this world of open source collaboration and standards collaboration for a long time. And you realize, huh, there's a set of organizations uh, in the standards world, the IETF and IEEE, in the open source world, Eclipse does a very good job in OpenStack. The thing that they got right is the transmission of culture and that idea of mentorship and apprenticeship. And when you look at these things, um, this is really how you teach the next generation about a complex piece of software. And so you start realizing again, that it doesn't just apply to open source. This is how, when you have a large complex software system, how you start to think about that evolution of the team and how do you think about the culture across it? So to me, fundamentally, all of this bleeds into a really interesting space really quickly. And so this is what continues to keep me digging down deeper and deeper and deeper. To give you a quick idea, and, and I'm going to go through this really quickly, so there's time for questions. Um, I, I basically walk people through a, in a lot of talks that I give, this idea of a mental model of how does open source work. And there is this idea of maintainers and working code sharing outbound with no expectation of anything in return. And the project has culture, and the governance is simply, you know, that, that documentation of that culture. And you can capture innovation back inbound if you actually go and build a community around it. And the communities really do evolve governance, but not always. They, they might be an evolving culture and the, and the documentation is very simple. Uh, two big projects that you can contrast in that way are Kubernetes versus Linux. Uh, Kubernetes has a very well documented uh, governance. Linux has a very rich and varied culture, a very evolved culture, but it's not like it's written down. And then if you do this really well, you end up in an ecosystem. Um, one of the things I try and teach is um, there's a set of activities, but these are just activities. These don't actually transmit culture. You know, this is the checklist of things that your project should do. They aren't necessarily 
that passing on of culture that is an apprenticeship teaching kind of way. Um, we know that uh, nonprofits are important. Uh, a dozen years ago, Henrik Ingo did a number crunch because we had far fewer projects to, to manage at the time. And he basically demonstrated that the nine largest, most vibrant communities were all hubbed inside of nine nonprofits. And the 10th was an order of magnitude smaller and hubbed in a company. Now he's a good engineer. He did not claim causality, but clearly there's a correlation. There's something going on here. And when you start to look at things, the bias that I always bring into these discussions is the only metric that matters when you're talking about project health is the inbound contribution flow. It's not about growth or size or number of stars or downloads or market cap or any of that other stuff. Um, secondary met metrics are absolutely interesting, but they often derive from the, what's the inbound cont contribution flow. And so there's this idea again of an evolution of a project, except what happens typically is at a certain point in the growth, if they're doing everything right, if it's a well-run community, you end up with cor corporate contributors and personal liability affecting the project. And essentially the evolution stops until you solve for those two problems. And likewise, in a modern corporate open source environment, you have, see a lot of companies desperately trying to start projects and say, come work with us. But again, there's that problem of you've got partners and customers in your community and setting those expectations becomes awkward. Um, indeed, what can really happen is you can have competitors in there with you as well. And so there's this problem you have of you hit this natural ceiling of growth very rapidly in a corporate setting and even in the wild if you're doing everything right. And the two problems in the wild are personal liability of the maintainers and companies wanting to engage really want more stability and neutrality. In the corporate space, you end up with, you need to signal neutrality to your partners and give up a certain amount of asset control. And at the same time, um, you also probably with your partners need antitrust protections in place around these discussions. You need to prove that you're not colluding. And a lot of nonprofit work in, regardless of whether it's C6s or C3s provides that uh, nonprofit protection. And so by putting these nonprofits in place, you end up solving for these problems that you otherwise had. And the reality is, um, the nonprofit enables the next wave of growth. But the thing here is you've got a new set of cultures that you now have to manage. So there's a set of cultures when you're just building the software, just the core maintainers, you, have a, you, you need to build a culture of enabling work. When you're building that community to capture inbound innovation, you need to uh, build a culture around enabling that contribution, what makes it easy. But then when you step into that nonprofit space, there's new cultures that need to be built and maintained. And that's around this idea of promoting stability and a fiduciary responsibility, a certain integrity to the act activities, and then organizational responsibility. And the thing in both of these groups, all three of these groups, is this idea of a culture of mentoring new members in. And so that's where I tend to get very excited about these when I go all the way back to Nower's original challenges around software in general and why exploring semesters of code continues to get more and more interesting for me all the time. Um, it's not just about teaching open source practices. Um, it's not just about teaching software engineering practices. It's actually teaching people how to understand mentorship and apprenticeship to make these, organize, these projects and project communities and then the nonprofits as the next level around them uh, more stable and more successful. That's all I have to say. Are there any questions? <laughs> let, me, let me drop the slides here. Okay. Got about 10 minutes, Carlos. Yeah, fantastic talk. Thank you so much. Um, my question is, when I see, especially the last part of your talk, uh, you know, this, uh, this, the, the nature of this, uh, of the open source endeavor, um, it reminds me a lot to, of like organizations, like open standards organizations, you know, IETF comes to mind. Uh, that it, can you say maybe a little bit more? Have you seen these parallels? Absolutely. So I, I, I have to live in a standards world as well as an open source world. 
and the fact that we are seeing all of the open source pro, uh, nonprofits race into the standard space that they don't understand, and all of the standards organizations race into the open source space that they don't understand. Um, it does create a certain amount of uh, angst for me. But when you step back and look at the, some of the individual organizations, um, IETF and IEEE do an amazing job of transferring culture. When you show up at an IETF event, uh, and there's three, three big conferences a year for you know, building the next iterations of those standards, um, they have a day zero mentality that says, you know, we have this big pile of documentation, patterns and practices for how we do things here. But day zero is, oh, you're new here. Let us show you how to succeed with us. And so it's all about the newcomer being made a successful member of the community so they can get work done. So that that's like startling. But then when you look at um, Eclipse, Eclipse is a really, so now let's shift over to that open source side of the house. Uh, the work I've done in Eclipse over the last 18 months, um, dramatically different from the Linux Foundation experience. Eclipse, again, rigorous you know, policies and procedures, stack a paper if we printed it all out. But the first thing they did is we built a new working group was to wrap staff around us to do the cultural uh, transmission to this is how we as a set of partners can succeed within Eclipse for the goals that we have. Um, same kind of thing when you, the one thing that OpenStack got right was their whole day zero onboarding. When you showed up at OpenStack, when you show up at OpenStack events, they still have a rigorous day zero training and engagement to wrap culture around newcomers to make sure they can be successful at OpenStack. So it's it's this kind of onboarding that I think is so critical. Um, uh, stories of, sorry, uh, Mel, I was just trying to read Mel's comment as well. I'll come back to Mel's comment in a minute. Um, so does that kind of answer it, Carl? Yes, absolutely. And uh, I think that um, I have another question that I let other people, it's unrelated, but I let other people. Okay. Um, speaking to, to Mel's question that um, stories of student failure. So we had one student last year uh, out of the 20, uh, there's rough, uh, I think it was 21 students that we had last year. And we had one student that was problematic in, in getting their student project done. And so there was a certain amount of rallying the mentors around that student to get them over the finish line. And that, that was the, the kind of the one student, the one data point we had last year. Uh, and it did take, you know, kind of, it takes a village kind of thing. Um, but the, the other thing that was really interesting that we saw last year, and it was, it's in that student space. So when I said one of the, one of the mentors just went missing uh, in a job transfer. So we had two mentors, one was university staff, one was a fourth year student mentoring other students in the uh, semesterly project. And there was five students working on student projects, two mentors, and the first one went missing in action quickly. And so a fourth year student basically picked up the mentoring load for five other students while they were in their graduating year and just did this phenomenal job of doing, doing the lift. Um, so I think it's kind of, I, I was sh shocked to see the success of that. Um, I, I, I will be trying to do this on two campuses at once this year where their semester start points are a little bit out of phase as um, is proving to be interesting uh, in terms of ramping the students and getting them to a no one build. But it's one of those things where, again, we're, it's, a, it's a growing experiment. Any other questions? I have another question if there's no other question. Okay. Sure. Um, so earlier today, uh, uh, Demetrius uh, was talking about inclusion and you know this idea that um, you know newcomers need to feel appreciated in a community um, and, and and you know their input needs to be valued and I think that um, I think while this is important right and you 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 
you have sort of this, uh, you definitely want to maintain that feeling of adequacy, you know, that they're right place and so forth. Um, what needs to be also paired with that is um, sort of a sense of what they don't know. And, um, you know, and sometimes they don't have that sense, right? So it's, it's, it's sort of an experience where um, there's newcomers have sometimes the sense that they, it's easy or they, they, they have sort of a way to, to contribute. And then, you know, they come, they're faced with this reality that there's actually much more to it, right? And so, and so that humbling experience can some people, you know, they feel like not appreciated. And so how do you, how do you convey, um, how do you sort of navigate that tension between intrusivity and, you know, so conveying I, people that they might need to know more? <laughs> I, I, was simply, I was simply humbled by the reality that I, I kept walking into the problem last year uh, and so I'm at least more aware of it this year, that um, I am too close to this and I've been doing it too long to simplify it for the students. So I'm trying to drive them to teach each other a little bit more this year uh, and to you know kind of do pre-class readings and bring it into discussions where they can actually have a real debate about some of these things. Um, one of the things I did last year is any week, I, I had to travel, I, I have to travel too much, but I, I, there was two logical points where I could do those term tests. And then the other class that week, I didn't ask me anything, but it wasn't with me because I'm just a boring old white guy. Um, I brought in a whole set of successful software engineers that looked like my class. Um, they were women. They were people of color, they were Asian, they were trans. And that, you know, so that the class could see itself because I have very diverse classes. Uh, certainly the Hopkins classes have been very diverse and I wanted them to be able to see themselves. And so that was an interesting challenge. I don't think I'm seeing the same kind of um, challenge merging into an open source community here because these are mentored projects. So the project mentor is basically that person that's smoothing that path. So it's not like I have a student that tried to turn in you know, a pull request that got suddenly slammed into a wall of other people. It's no, they're being mentored into that process by somebody that's already in the project. Does that kind of answer the question? Yeah, so I mean, I think there is sort of this this aspect of, um, you know, I don't know. It's I don't think it's just a showing diversity in the mentorship. I think it's also I don't know how to do that. Right? It's actually a real question. I don't know. I don't no, know. It, it's, it's, it's it's a hard problem. Yeah. I mean, we, we are trying to pivot an industry that, you know, I've been in the industry for four decades now. And in the second decade, uh, a colleague and I started to get excited. We were going to use Next conferences constantly and we were seeing kind of a rise in the number of women. And we were really excited that this is fantastic. We're actually finally seeing you know, a, a better gender balance coming. And then we realized, no, the, the women were program managers, they were documenters, they were testers, they weren't developers. And you know, so we continue to, to have this challenge in the industry. Uh, there was a comment earlier uh, in the earlier panel that you know, open source has a problem with diversity and, and we do. And I think it's getting better, but it's still a challenge and it's a challenge for figuring out how do we create that in the culture because we're talking about cultural change right so it's even you know how how do we mentor the mentors <laughs> in into this space you know how do, how do you you know the the best guess i could make last year was the ask me anything sessions with uh, a collection of i guess there were six different professionals that i used uh, that were all friends and colleagues that i used last year uh, to stand in front of the class and at, and and answer questions in that space I'm lucky that my mentors, for the most part, are a diverse group as well. But it's, you know, it's 
hard figuring our way into that discussion. Yeah, Steve, I'm curious to hear if you agree with this or not. Um, the broader question of how do you include people, but can they need to upgrade your skills, right? Yeah. So there's two things that I think were important in the context of this course. One is that sort of framework of levels of complexity. So understanding that contributing to documentation is important. You may not be making a code contribution that's accepted and so on, but you're making a contribution. So a variability of contributions is one way to sort of be close to right. Um, and the, the other I would say is that one of the primary ways when Stephen and the mentors were asked to evaluate the students is, where were you when you began this course and where are you now? So sort of seeing, have you learned a lot in the process, which is good, but if you picked a very easy thing and you learned a lot, that's different than if you picked a very difficult one, right? And went further along. So I, I think just having those kinds of, you know, assessments or whatever you want to call them in place, it isn't along the lines of race and gender things that we're just discussing about, but I do think it gives students a sense of, I can try different things here. And even if I get a good grade, that doesn't necessarily mean I'm ready to be, you know, a technical contributor. Yeah, it, the, the thing we, we were looking for, I, I wasn't worried about success being pull requests. I was worried about the student having a learning experience in the real world in what real software at scale looked like. And so that that's what we were reaching for is that first touch of this is what real software uh, at scale looks like. You know, you, this isn't your homework. It's not a small project you've shared with 10 friends, not even 100 people, which means they're probably not your friends anymore. We're now dealing with software that's being used by hundreds and hundreds of people, um, possibly thousands. You know, when you look at the PowerShell, okay, possibly millions. Um, so you're, you're stepping into a space where the student is getting to see the impact, but the student's also realizing that this is a, the, the job they're, they're stepping into is actually a fairly complex world. And it's as much about managing your interaction in the team, and I'll say the team rather than the community here, as it is about writing software. But I think I'm over time right now. So I'm, I'm, I'm figuring Stephanie's going to bring out the hook any moment. Okay. SJ just showed up too. So uh, <laughs> we're ready for the next <laughs> panel. All right. Thanks so much, Stephen. Thank um, you, everybody. And thanks for all the questions. Okay. As, as, uh, as the